gentlemen. Uh, what do you want? I hope you enjoyed that oh. cheese sandwich. <laughs> it might be your last. Same <laughs> with you, fish. I hope you're enjoying taking a video of me, taking a video of you, taking a video of me, because this might be our last. Everybody had a camera. And, and if they didn't have it, when they got there, by the time they left, it was there. And that's why we got so much video. There are sometimes even in firefights, you know, somebody would pull out their camera, stick it on a ledge, and just, you could hear what was going on. You may not be able to see what was going on, but you could hear it. You could hear guys yelling and radio conversations and stuff like that. Nobody, you know, told us we really couldn't, so we did. Cruder! Yes? Cruder, what time is it? Oh, yeah, get them! Sergeant Anthony L. Goodwin, 1st Platoon, Lima Company, 3rd Battalion, 25th Marines, killed in action, 8 May 2005, in New Ubaidi, Iraq. I don't, I don't really talk to many people about what happened. Corporal Dustin A. Durga. Things aren't the same anymore. Everything's just kind of dead. It's, a lot of things aren't interesting to me anymore. Killed in action, 8 May 2005, in New Ubaidi, Iraq. Uh, I'm starting to think that it's, it's not important that they know what we went through. Lance Corporal Wesley G. Davids, 1st Platoon. I don't think I'll ever be the same. I don't think anybody that goes to Iraq and does what and does what we do or had done is ever the same. BFC Christopher R. Dixon, First Platoon, Lima Company, Third Battalion, 25th Marines, held in action, 11. I talked to two Marines from my school. One said that he had never fired his weapon when he was over there, and the other said he might have fired it once. And he said, don't worry about it, you're a reservist, you're gonna get sent somewhere out of the way where you can't do any damage and you can't do any harm, you know, and you're just gonna guard something or you might walk around the desert for a little while. I was just thinking, you know, we're gonna get stuck on the wire somewhere and just be pulling watch the whole time and uh, not see a damn thing. We'd probably sit around, run some patrols, and eat food and get fat. 
Say hi to our new humble home. Look the bottom of the sweat to the top of his toe for five bucks. Go. Five dollars. Go. Go, do it. 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 from our balcony. Haditha Dam, you know, is built by the Soviets. And it's large, it's cavernous, it's industrial. There's bats that live there that fly around all over the place. But at the same time, it's home. And it's producing electricity, about 30% for the country of Iraq. The Azerbaijanis control the wire. They're providing our security. There's Iraqi workers that come in to work there. And then you've got us. You've got the grunts there. And we launch out of that place all the time to do different missions all up and down the Euphrates River. Yeah, we're getting ready to head out on another nice and not exciting patrol through South Dam Village. But we will probably discover Jack and get eaten up by millions of bugs. But uh, it's all in good times. So that's why we do it. And that's why we're here. We did a lot of little missions, little little patrols and stuff like that at first, just to get us started, I guess. Probably our first big missions going in and clearing Haditha. You've never been in a city like this. All of a sudden, you know, the streets aren't straight. A curve and there's little nooks and crannies you know there's walls around everything you know not only do you have to like get in the outside gate but now you got to get in the inside come on put the muscle into it ah! Ah! <laughs> oh there's nothing <laughs> You know, before anybody got hurt, it was really exciting and uh, and almost fun. You know, it's it's like a video game. <laughs> oh, got it! <laughs> it's the most exciting thing you'll ever experience. It's the most fun thing you'll ever experience when you get in a firefight. It's the biggest adrenaline. There's no drug in the world that could ever jack you up like that. So in the beginning, it's, it's the best thing ever. It's just awesome, you want it every day. And then uh, once, you know, the bad stuff starts happening and uh, you'll have some of the worst days of your life. Before we left for training, I mean, Dirk and I would always hang out, you know, on campus at OSU and, you know, go to parties and everything like that. He was just always crazy. He'd just do the crazy stuff. I mean, jumping bushes and make me laugh all the time. And that's why I, I liked him. I mean, he was just a great guy to hang out with. How are you? Hi. <laughs> too much, too much to food. <laughs> <laughs> Our mission was to disrupt the insurgents from coming over to this area across the Euphrates called Ramana, where no one has been. No coalition forces have really been. Right there, you've got the Syrian border. You know, you can see Syria. You can see the town over on the other side of the border. You had to drive by this town of New Ubaidi, to where the army was building a bridge for us so we could get across to the other side. Ubaidi wasn't in the plan at all, wasn't even briefed. Everything was flowing smooth till we got close to the river. And once we started getting impacts of mortars and uh, machine gun fire, we had to identify the threat 
because if we bypassed it and we left our flanks and our rear exposed, they could have literally, uh, you know, wiped us all out. Basically, we dismounted from the tracks under fire. We ran to our sectors in the, in the town, and we started clearing houses. Gunfire. It was just chaos. You could hear the rounds going off, armor pierced tracer rounds, and you could see them just deflecting off the house. The town was just going nuts. There was small arms fire everywhere. I mean, these guys were crazy. You would see a cobra swoop down over the town, and they would shoot at the damn cobra. That's Sergeant Goodwin. He's walking up the middle of the road like nothing's going on, you know? He's got his American flag, you know, bandana draped around his neck. He's just like George Patton or something, you know? And at the time, I'm like, this guy is crazy, you know? I looked at him, and, and he's like calm as could be, so it kind of it eased my nerves a lot. All right, we've been in uh, firefights all day. As you can hear, um, we just got word there's uh, four of our first squad wounded, one of our docks. We don't know about the other three. Sounds like some of the team leaders. Um, we're all freaking pretty pissed off, and it's getting pretty dark. Uh, and other than that, we're going to try and make it out of here in one piece tonight. My squad was on the house, and we were just pretty much told, ordered to stay put. You could hear the rounds going off, and they didn't quite know what was going on at first. And that's when you knew something was, you, I got a bad feeling after that. We were about a quarter of the way through the town. The sun was starting to go down a little bit. A lot of the fighting that we were hearing was tapering off, and it sounded like it was moving further back, and we weren't engaging anymore. We weren't seeing much. We were on what was definitely the last house of the day, I'm about to kick the door in. And uh, somebody, they opened up on him with a machine gun. Lance Corporal West kicked in the door, and he got shot in both legs. And then Durga turned and got shot in the back with an armor-piercing round. His face was completely gray, and his, his eyes were kind of open and fixed. And I, I wasn't sure if he was alive or not. We tried to get a pressure dressing onto his wound, which all we could do was hold it on there. Just hearing things on the radio was just a shock, because I've never heard something like that before. And all I could do was just pretty much tell my squad from what I heard on the radio what was going on. And then uh, it just seemed to keep going on. The squad was still going in under fire. We hit each different room cleared all the rooms, it was an empty house. And there's, where the stairs go up to the roof, there's a small closet, short one, like three feet high, whatever. I started looking at like, this closet and just thinking, something is off about this closet, you know? And, and so I uh, shot some rounds and stuff into the, through the wall in the closet, you know, in case there's anybody in there. Staff's trying to go and open the door to the closet. There was a guy waiting for him underneath there, and he fired a burst at Staff Sergeant Goodwin, and it was coming upward. And it got him, and he went down. The way he was laying, it just wasn't quite close enough to like go out and grab him and pull him out without getting shot. I regret that to this day, that I didn't make more of an effort than I did, but um, I, I tried it as close as I could to him, and I was just, I tried to kind of whisper to him, you know, where is, you know, you know, where are they? And he couldn't even really move, he just kind of moved his hand like that. And then, so I was like, oh, I don't, I don't even know what that means. Nobody really wanted to leave. Nobody wanted to leave his body there. They didn't want these guys to get away. They wanted to figure out something to take these guys out and get staff started going on. But they told us they were gonna drop the, Jets were going to drop a bomb, so we, uh, we got it. They made us leave. Uh, they dropped that, but I guess it, it missed. It landed out in the, the open area a little bit away from the house and didn't do a whole lot of damage to it. Uh, 
Um, so the next morning, they fired some small rounds. And then um, they went in to recover Stassar and Goodwin's body. And so the next day, they took us out into the desert. And uh, Gunnar Hurley came over all the tracks. And, you know, he said that look in his face. And you pretty knew, pretty much knew what, was, what he was going to say. And uh, he's got that feeling, you know. And uh, he said, uh, Corporal Durga didn't make it. And uh, that was probably the toughest thing to deal with. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've been in that bar more than I've ever been in the bars in my life. I'm not a bar person, I never have been. But I don't go there for the, quote, bar part of it. It's the social part of it. Being able to talk to his friends again, you know, laugh, listen to music, that's my support. That helps me get through. I have said, you know, why? How many thousands, 160 some thousand troops over in Iraq and you think to yourself, what are the chances that would be my son? It, no, it doesn't seem fair. It's been difficult. It's always there. No, it, I mean, it never goes away. You might not think about it every minute, but it's always there. It's always something. And it's going to be different without Dustin being here, obviously, but uh, I know he would want us to celebrate Christmas in the way that we always have, so. He was old boy. I mean, uh, loved his G.I. Joes, loved football, loved his trains, cars, trucks. And he, you know, as a little kid, he always said he was going to be a, either a soldier or a fireman, and he became both. Last Christmas, Dustin was yeah. with us, both Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. And that didn't always happen. I remember uh, a very special time in the morning, Christmas morning, I got up and Bob had gotten up and Dustin was still sleeping, and I was making breakfast, and I couldn't figure out where Bob went. And I went into the um, side bedroom, and he and Dustin were laying in bed hugging. And that was a wonderful, wonderful thing to see. And, and, and I just left him there I, and said, I'm making breakfast, and just take your time. I walked in the room. And it just took me back to when he was a little kid on Christmas morning. And and I just, he, he was wrapped up in the blankets and I just laid down next to him and gave him a big hug and patted his head. And uh, I'll cherish that moment for, till, till my death. It uh, really meant a lot. Our gracious and loving God, we thank you for the beauty of this season, the joy that surrounds us, the gift of your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. As we pray, as you taught us to pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. One thing I don't wonder about is whether he's in heaven. And that was my biggest fear when he died, that I would never have that assurance. And it's the farthest thing from my mind now. Thine is the kingdom. Bob and I don't, we're not on the same page on that. I think he, he believes differently that 
You know, in his mind, Dustin, there was it was his time, and he was ready to go almost like it was a good thing. But I don't believe that. I mean, I believe that, you know, he was taken much too young, and he had a life to live, and maybe it's just selfish on my part, but I wanted to be there to see him live it. Tracks are the worst modes of transportation I would ever recommend to anybody. It's like somebody running a jackhammer up your ass, pretty much. <laughs> You're sitting on a metal bench, maybe that much padding, and you are hitting rocks, you are hitting everything the desert can offer. And then if you're not sitting down, you're standing up providing security, and now you're slamming your fingers on the edge, falling over when we start hitting hills and everything. You're catching exhaust, because the genius who invented the tracks put the exhaust pipe right next to your head, so everything's blown in your face. No air conditioning. Usually your water's on top, and it's already boiling hot by the time you need it. Inside's full of flies and stinky Marines, <laughs> I mean, it's no fun. I'm doing security, so I'm standing up, and um, I can kind of see around everywhere. And it's like this little village, you know, and uh, we're driving along, and as we're driving, you, know, you see all these these like families out in their yards and all waving at us and these little kids are out playing and they're jumping around and everybody seems to be happy that we're there. So I remember getting like a good, real good feeling. I was like, all right, that's a really good sign because you know, like, you know, you always hear that you know if you see kids playing, nothing's gonna happen. And all of a sudden I was looking around and I started like, oh wait, there's there's no more people around. I didn't have my goggles down like I was supposed to, and I remember pulling my goggles down over my eyes. I was looking for my um, gloves. They're like fire-resistant gloves. I was looking for those, and I was like, and I remember I left them in my, uh, I left them in my pack on the side of the, the track. So just a little bit after that, you know, all of a sudden, uh, boom. First squad's track just hit a freaking mine. Uh, as you see, it's it's freaking it's in flames. Uh, I mean, there were rounds cooking off, flying out of there, and uh, I ran around and I saw Lance Corporal Camp standing there. I got thrown back into the track, landed on my back, like inside of the track. And I just remember standing up and my hands and face are on fire. And just being like, just kind of freaking out. I just started hitting myself in the face with my, my arm, you know. And I got my face off really fast, off fire. And then I'm trying to get my hands out. I'm going like this and hitting them. And just, they wouldn't go out for a little while. And it's kind of, I don't know, it's, it was really, it was really nasty, you know. And just looking around and I see Sergeant Bell standing up, and he's just kind of like this. Everything was completely black. I couldn't see, and I started to feel the heat coming from the fire that started instantly. And um, I started feeling around for the emergency latch released for the, the ramp. The latch opened. It was kind of like an avalanche, you know, bodies falling out through the true patch. And when I rolled over and looked up off of my back, uh, the next person I saw coming out was completely on fire. I remember hearing um, PFC Dixon yelling to me from inside the track. You know, can you, can you help me, help me, you know. And I kind of crawled in, picked myself up, crawled in, and uh, I'm staying really low because there's, you know, ammunition's popping off. and explosions going off and stuff, so I'm trying to keep really, really low. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty scared, and, and uh, but I'm just thinking, you know, this kid, it's got to be a lot more scared than I am. And, you know, and I had known Dixon. He was in, in my fire team originally. 
I always kind of looked after him and stuff because he's pretty young and everything. Pretty much younger than just about everybody else. I remember talking to him. I'm like, listen, I was like, I, I'm, I was like, because my hands were all fried up and the skin's all falling off and I, my hands. And I was just like, listen, I, I was like, I, I'm pretty weak right now. I was like, see, so you got to help me get you out. I was like, because I can't do it by myself. And he's just like, all right, all right. Getting almost out of the track now. I'm pulling as hard as I can. And all of a sudden, it's just like a ex little explosion. And it kind of blew me back. And I got up again, and I'm, I'm grabbing anything I can, his clothes, his flag jacket. I'm trying to grab him, pull him by his helmet at one point. And I'm trying to talk to him, and he's not responding anymore. I turned jolly and basically grabbed me and started pulling me off out of the way. The helicopters just kept coming and coming. I mean, there was that mass casualty. You know, emotionally, it was just draining because, you know, you find out that Ivy was alive when he got put on the bird. But then, uh, at least that's what I heard, that he was alive, but just barely. And then he ended up not making it. David's was alive when he left. And you found out he didn't make it. And you find out, like, uh, Lance Corporal Grant had just gotten moved to first squad, so he would have normally been on our track. He was on the other track, you know, so that bothers you. PFC Dixon, I mean, that kid was just fresh out of high school. Monday, 1.49 p.m. Hey everybody, this is Chris. Um, just calling to tell you guys that I'm doing all right and I'll be all right. We're all right. So, and love you all and miss you very much. So, um, I'll let you as much as I can and try to get a hold of you as much as I can. I uh, love you guys. Bye. I got up on a Friday. I took off and went to the store to get more things for a care package. And as I came back, pulled in the driveway, there was no van out front. There was nothing here. I had no clue Marines was here in our house. The neighbor lady came out, and she said, I was getting the stuff out of the truck. And I, she said, Becky, you need to come in here. And I said, what's wrong? And she just had me around the shoulder so tight. And she said, you need to come in here. And I said, is it Chris? <laughs> she said, you need to come in here. Dave was standing at the door. He was crying. I walked in, and there was a Marine to the top of the steps. There was two Marines here in the living room. And when I walked in, I said, not Chris. And he said, yes, ma'am, I'm sorry to inform you. But they had told Dave that they wouldn't leave until I had come home from the store to tell me the news. They said, if it takes two hours, we'll stay here. Because Dave says, I can't tell her that news. And that he made him take the van down the road to where I wouldn't see it when I pulled in. This still is his room, and um, it's, uh, you know, he's gone, but um, it's just, I can't put everything away right now. I'm not ready for that, and um, I feel close to Chris in here. Um, that's why I haven't taken anything to him, not yet. It might not never get changed. Not for many years, but um, I come in here, and uh, this is his stuff. You know, it's what he where he got to in 17 years before he left for the Marines. What are you in the room for? Oh, it's your deal. How much money do you have? <laughs> we met in 2000. <laughs> And uh, we were both living in the same dorm at Ohio State. 
just happened like that. So five, year late, five years later, we're still together. <laughs> yeah. I know you love to shop, Mark. Get excited. I actually got back into the States in May, but I, I was in the hospital. She actually, she came down and see me when I got there. Yeah. You know, I, I, I didn't look so hot when she first saw me. I thought you looked good, you know? I mean, well, I guess for what you were yeah. I usually stick with big, big ears. Earrings, I love the ears. Which yeah. would be, with your hair down, would be very nice. Yeah. And then you could still, I mean, we have a lot of jobs. We've had our ups and downs, but him, you know, coming close to dying made me really realize what's important in life, you know, and that's, you know, your family and your loved ones. You know, things are meant to happen, and I think we were meant to stay together, even though everyone thinks we're crazy. All uh, right, get married. <laughs> I don't know. Uh. Um, we haven't made any arrangements yet because he's still finishing school, and I just graduated, and you know, college students were broke. So, <laughs> but um, we're just gonna take it step by step. You like it? Probably get married in the next year, settle down, have kids, and hopefully, yeah. we want kids. Oh, Look at the baby this. clothes. So cute. Are you hungry? Well, for a while there, right after Matador, I was paranoid. Uh, I did not want to get back in a track. I thought about you, Beatty, about, you know, assaulting houses. I remember going over it and going over it and going over it. And what would I do? I mean, and the only answer I came up with is probably the same thing those guys did because they didn't know. It was pretty scary because you really don't know what to expect. You could clear a thousand houses, but uh, you never know what's in that one. God is righteous in whatever he does. And uh, I didn't know why that happened, but I knew that he did. And uh, when it's your turn to go, you go. You know, part of me wants to say, you know, God has a plan and everything will work out for the best. And then part of me says, things don't always work out for the best. Things just happen. The primary mission was that different towns and different locations in the late night there were uh, cell group meetings that may or may not be occurring. So we were to work our way into a town during the dark hours and conduct a coordinate search of that area. The dogs in country, people may kind of snicker and laugh at it. The dogs are vicious. I would probably rather cross paths with a bear than an Iraqi dog. Well, this dog was awakened by a squad of Marines walking right next to it. So it panicked and attacked. I was standing maybe five feet from the Marine when he shot the dog. He had no choice in the matter. That kind of woke up the neighborhood, I think. As I understand it, the squad was out in the middle of the street. And when the fire fight broke out, first thought was, we got to get out of the street. Sergeant Winberg's squad was just behind me. That building there, clear it. It didn't matter where we were at or what we were doing or how bad it looked at the time. He was always on top of things. He was Superman. If the world was falling apart, he could hold it together just by his mere presence. The only thing I knew was it probably took a whole army to take him down. But he was a coward behind a door. I mean, it could be that this thing was something that was nothing more than a dog. And these guys didn't know who was out there killing their dog. And they didn't even know, they might not have even known it was U.S. Marines out there or U.S. forces. They might have just thought somebody shot their dog and they shot through the wall to protect themselves. Who knows? I do know one thing out of all the firefights and all the engagements over there, it's the only time I know of with 2nd Platoon that the people we fought that morning were only Iraqis. The Iraqi people really don't care whether we're in control or the insurgents are in control. And it's really frustrating to know that, okay, I'm here in your country, 
in your town, risking my life for, uh, for basically for you. And you, you don't want to help me in any way. So our next big mission, about, I don't know, the day before, they walked up and said, hey, we're getting some Iraqi special forces, um, and, and you're going to be their handler. And I'm like, their what? They're like, their handler. You're going to get like four or so Iraqi special forces, and I'm like, okay. I don't speak Iraqi. You know, at first I didn't want to, you know, I was like, there's no, I don't even want to do this. You know, I don't want to be here. I, you know, I'm not, you know, we're not with Lima Company. They just looked like they grabbed him off the street and handed him an AK and said, here you go, buddy, you know, go fight a war. And I'm like, great, you know, can I trust these guys? Are, are they going to be bad guys? We go into this town and go to knock on a door, and I go to step up and, you know, knock on the door, and the first thing that they do is push me back. We were doing, like, mass searches for looking for weapons. They went to certain spots, other things they would just completely not even check. Looking in a freezer and digging through to see if there's weapons stored underneath all the meat and vegetables and stuff. Um, going out and digging through stuff in the backyard stomping up and down on the floors to see if they're hollow. Just all kinds of weird stuff. And bam, when they're done, they'd look at me and go, good, and out the door we go. They knew what they were looking for. They, they knew it's their country. <laughs> One of them came up with a CD player. Some Marine gave it to him, and he wanted to know if I could burn him some Britney Spears. So I had to dig through the archives, but I found some Britney Spears. They liked the hip hop music, you know, rap, and they weren't too into country music because they said it was too slow. But when I started playing the hip hop stuff, they'd be like, oh yeah, it's good, good. It's good? It's good. Yeah. Once we started to get more on a personal level with them, we started to give them all nicknames. You know, we called one guy, we called him Beavis, because he looks like Beavis from Beavis and Butthead. We called another guy old school because he was he looked like he was 90 years old. And I would learn about them, you know, they were married and how many kids they had, how many wives they had, you know, if they had any more than one. And then the rest of the time, we would just joke around, you know. Even though they were speaking Arabic, I was starting to pick up on some of the phrases, and they wanted to learn English, so I was teaching them, you know, I was teaching them good, wholesome American English. Somebody else was teaching them to cuss. I don't know who that was, but it wasn't me. We'd get a lot of flack from some of the guys. You know, I can't believe you guys hang out with these people. You know, I mean, these are Iraqi people, and but we go out with them on patrols. We leave the wire with them. I mean, we're out there, and if something goes down, these guys have our back, and you know, we have theirs in the same in the same thing. So, to me, every one of those Iraqi National Guardsmen that was willing to do that made up for a hundred of the civilians who just didn't care because that's a civilian who is taking action. He's trying to do something. He, he cares about the country. This is a uh, I think it is a stress relief. I think it's a healthy stress relief, too. You know, I'm just shooting at targets. I mean, I can't think how many rounds I put down range with the Marine Corps. So it's just, and it's also one of those things. You know, you just get back from Iraq. We carry a weapon with us all the time. And it's, uh, I don't know. And the other thing is, it just keeps you in practice. I mean, you know, the more you shoot, the better you're going to be at it when you actually get to the range, so. And like I said, it's a stress relief. It's kind of like hitting a golf ball, you know, you picture your boss's face on a golf ball and just smack it all over the golf course. You don't care where it goes, you just keep hitting it. So, <laughs> I'm not saying that I'm shooting my boss or anything, but I haven't seen my boss in years. <laughs> That one got away from me a little bit. 
It's my favorite thing to do is shoot. Who's going next? The company went up to Operation Spear up in Carabla. I wasn't to the stage, you know, at that point where I just wanted to go murder everybody. But I knew that place was full of them foreigners, and I knew that they would come out, and I wanted to be a part of that. We were told our mission was to find evidence that foreign fighters were coming in. We had to go on a, on a long track across the desert to get to this place, and we stayed off of the roads because they're all mined and their IDs on them and so forth. But when we got there, they were firing off these line charges. It's almost like a fire hose with a rocket on the end of it. it shoots through the air, and it drags this line charge behind it. When it lands, it blows up. And what it does is it blows all the mines and all the bombs out of the way. Whoa, damn. Hey, they're detonating. And uh, that was our signal to launch into the attack. Helicopters were strafing the city with their guns. And so, you know, already you hear explosions starting off. And they're telling us, your rules of engagement have changed. Anybody that's in the city is bad. We're using tanks. We're using uh, the Trax 50 cal. We're blowing through walls. We're not using front doors. We also had intelligence that there was lots of uh, car bombs, so we were authorized to take out any car on the road. I hate to say it, we blew that city to pieces. Oh, damn. I was with the Iraqis. Those were my guys. I mean, my squad for five months was my Iraqis. We found a lot of weapons, AKs and RPGs. We were running up the middle, and we started taking fire. You know, four insurgents run across. They're over by the mosque. Two of them get taken out by Kilo 3-2 across the way. And we know we wounded one of them, and we thought he was in the mosque. To go inside a mosque, it's, it's pretty big medicine. Like, you got to have some higher up saying that it's all right. And so we called up to hire. We said, are we cleared to go in? I get a call on the radio from, from Major Tolan. He says, hey, I need you to bring the Iraqis up here. Um, we're going to assault the mosque. You good? Let's go. We go in. I, I step foot inside and let them do all the sweeping. We find nothing inside. I was looking around the outside, around the courtyard, and a couple Iraqi Freedom Guard, they're saying something back and forth, peeking around this corner. And I walk around the side, and there's a guy under the tree laying there with an AK in his lap. I thought he was dead. So I start walking up to him, and as I walk up, he cocks his leg and he aims in on me. And so I start shooting him, and then the two Iraqis just unload on this guy. That was the closest I'd been to an insurgent. From me to you was how about how close we were. And uh, after that, then you get hit with the reality, like, man, I could have just got shot right there. On those two individuals, the one in the mosque and the one over in this alley that Sergeant Hoffman's squad killed, we found, you know, lots of money on them. They were loaded for bear. They had more ammo than you can shake a stick at. They had drugs on them and uh, grenades and everything else. And we found an ID from Syria. And that's what we came up there to prove, was that Syria was pretty much not controlling the borders. They're letting people come in. And so we've got pretty good evidence that there's foreign fighters in these towns. You know where we're at? Just go uh, north up the road, hang a left after the mosque, and when you see the human leg in the road, uh, that's where we are. Yeah, okay, good to go. Blue six out.
Yeah. I gotta find somebody to play Santa Claus tomorrow. Uh, watch out. Hey, starting to merge. You wanna go play Santa Claus tomorrow? You wanna go play Santa Claus tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> Where at? Sunbury. What time? 13 to 7. They got a suit for us, right? Hey, see if you can find somebody starting to uh, merge. You know, I, I love the snow, I love the cold, but this year I just can't get used to it. You know, I walked out the door this morning and the first thing in my mind was, at least it's warm in Iraq. <laughs> it's like eight degrees outside. I'm like, you know, it'd be nice to have some sand right now. When we were over there, you could talk to somebody, you could say a few words, they knew what you wanted and then you could get it accomplished. Here, <laughs> you got to expect it to be a lot slower pace. You know, you're with your girlfriend, it's like, all right, I'm hungry, let's go to dinner. And it's like, okay, and then two hours later, while well, she's still putting makeup on, and you know, it just drives me up the wall. I just need to find somebody to play Santa Claus tomorrow. I'm leaving on a jet plane. I, I don't know when I'm gonna be back again. <laughs> Lima's legacy from their deployment is gonna be that we lost a bunch of people, and not everything that we did over there. And yeah, it was important that we lost a lot of people and those people need to be remembered, they do. But our accomplishments as well, because they were their accomplishments too, they should be right there side by side. You know, Barwana was like wild, wild west. That was nasty. When, but, but you know, we were there like a, you know, a few times cleaning it up and now there's a huge line of people going to vote. And they said a uh, statistic on one of the big news channels that Al Anbar in the last election had 10% voting, and this election had 75%. And it's like that, the time between that election was us, you know? I mean, from 10 to 70%, that's a huge jump. I mean, we couldn't really ask for much more than that. I mean, Americans don't vote at 70%. <laughs> The insurgents had put out the word that anyone coming into heat would die a fiery death. So when it came down that we were going to go into heat, um, yeah, there was some concern. The insurgent network had support there, major support. Money, they would hide them, they would broadcast messages for them over the loudspeakers from the mosques. So they had a major support network in heat, and we had to shut that off. They had IEDs, improvised explosive devices. One way into town, they had like 14 or 17 or something like that along the road going into town. And uh, we went in there and there wasn't a whole lot of shots fired, wasn't much of a fight. So far up to that point, uh, in all of the operations that we had conducted, we had swept and pushed. So in other words, we swept through the city, cleared every house, cleared every yard, cleared every chicken coop. And then once we were done and we felt good about it, we would push on to conduct another operation or back to our base to refit. Um, for this one, we did not. We did a sweep and hold. We held operating bases inside the city of Heat. And we conducted a patrols, security patrols, safety patrols, whatever you want to call them, and ensured that the people knew that uh, 325 was going to be there and we were there to stay. What they say, there's like 130,000 people in that town, something like that. And then, you know, we're out there patrolling it at all hours. I wouldn't say it, it was tense. I wouldn't say it was peaceful, you know. Walking through the streets, the marketplace. This place is insane because there's way too many people and there's no reason we should be here. But we're doing it anyways. We weren't going to allow the insurgents to take the city back. We weren't going to allow them to influence the Iraqi citizens anymore. 
And then that's when they started coming back in. They didn't want to just walk away from the city. They had caches, they have weapons, they have communication assets in that city that they did not want to give up. They started creeping back and sneaking in and setting in explosive devices on the roads. Yeah. All right. Good and people wonder why I hate this country. It's because of this right here. Somebody tried to blow us the up. The insurgents use the IDs because they, they can't fight us toe-to-toe. -to -toe. It's their only means in which to actually bloody our nose, per se. Anything could be an IED. Anything. And you do one of two things. Either you can, you can freeze and do nothing and pray to God that, you know, you're not standing on top of the thing, or you can go out and carry out your mission. On that particular day, they were on their way back from a two-hour patrol. They had gone out to our furthest limit, and they were making it back. They were on the backside of the mosque. And there was an explosive device right behind the mosque against the fence line. The wires went through the wall and led back to the mosque. When the ID detonated, it immediately killed an Iraqi soldier. And the fragmentation also struck two other Iraqi soldiers, then also Corporal Foote and Doc Youngblood. Within five minutes, I was at that position. We stopped the bleeding. I thought we might be able to save his leg and his foot. And he was giving me advice as the corpsman. Gunny, you're touching in the wrong place. You know, I'm like, look, just shut up, you know. And he, his last words to me were, Hey, tell the guys, I will be back. Don't get another corpsman for the platoon. I will be back. Everybody's worried about Dr. Gillenblad until we hear that he's been stabilized and that he, he's going to be OK. Uh, however, he, he's going to lose a foot. Feeling the platoon was, all right, awesome. He's alive. He's going home. We get relieved in the heat, and we're uh, looking forward to trying to get contact with the young blood once we get back to the dam where we have a little better communications. And Doc Jenkins says, uh, young blood died. And I just look at him, and he's a, he looks back at me, and I'm like, Doc. And, uh, He goes, it's true. Uh, he died because of some internal, internal damage from the IED blast. After um, I found out Travis had passed, I wrote a letter to his wife. Because not only did he leave behind a young son, she was pregnant with the daughter that she delivered in uh, September. And, uh, you know, I wrote to her and I told her, you know, I know that your son uh, had a limited time with his father. He's a young kid. He's probably three years old. Um, and I know that your daughter will never know her father. But I want to tell you what I thought of him as a man. And hopefully when her children get to be an age that they can appreciate it, she'll let them read those letters and know that their father didn't die in vain, that he saved lives, many lives, not just Marines, Iraqis too. And he meant the world to us. Say thank you. Thank you. Give me five. Who won the treasure box? Who promised me a star today? What'd you get? A dinosaur. Bye. Every year we'd go on a camping trip as a family, and uh, no, I wasn't looking forward to camping pregnant, but um, Hunter wanted to go. No, I, I, I. So July 13th, I flew in and um, never left. Because two days after I got here, someone came by and told me what happened to Trav. Travis was one of those guys that no one could not like. You had to like Travis. You couldn't get mad at him. 
Now they always talk about his comic relief for the platoon and how if they're ever going to do a movie that Drew Carey would play him. He loved, you know, just being a fool. <sighs> where is Hunter? Where is Hunter? Yeah. Ah. Hunter, you know, he just wants to make people laugh. Let's get your pants on. Come here. He always says I'm hilarious, just like my daddy was. Hunter. Where is Hunter? Where is Hunter? Hunter, where are you? I'm outside. You're outside, Hunter? OK, I'm going to go to the toy store, and I'll, um, I'll make sure I don't get anything for you. I'll get something for your sister. <laughs> Emma had her days and nights confused for a long time. And um, I knew it was bad when I started screaming out for Travis. What is? This is a storm. When this storm, God gets sing. How do you even learn how to change a diaper to help me? Five years old. <laughs> and I didn't want to do that to him. I would never take his childhood away from him. And um, I love her enough to know that I can't do it by myself right now. So my parents took her for a month, a little over a month. And she'll be back in April. I got a place to stay. I got a, th a three bedroom house to rent. And um, we're gonna have a place to call home for now. And um, we'll be a family again. You're a wild animal. Well, I'm not part of it right now, but it's about a firefight about 25 meters off to our left, and it's pretty sweet. Siegel is a town that we were uh, going to do a coordinate search. Got one here. Later. Got two left this way. Hundreds and hundreds of times we've done it. And it was not a really heightened threat level. No one in this room, clearly in here. We anybody in here? About halfway through the town, first squad, they come across a house that when Corporal Williams went up to knock on the door, I was told he raised his hand to knock and his hand never struck the door. We heard initial burst of rounds. Then there was a gap, and just as I was getting ready to say something to my radio man about, we need to work our way over towards first squad. Numerous rounds started firing. It was a major fight. Those guys in Sikla, they were buried in them houses pretty good, and they were, they were pretty good at setting the trap, you know, trying to get a Marine down, and then you know, trying to lure people in. You know, supposedly, if we took fire from houses, no, we weren't going to rush the house. We were just going to pull back and drop it. And that didn't exactly happen. And we got an Iraqi wounded as well. And half, and half, shoot, and half. Shot in the face and shot in the arm. We got an Iraqi wounded. We got an Iraqi wounded. Shot in the face. I said, I have to. The firefight had already started with first squad. First squad had already been engaged, but we had not yet. Uh, then we heard from the roof that uh, they saw a guy coming at us. Hey, we got two guys. Hey, I can see two guys. Hey, where? Uh, they were running away from where Corporal Williams had been killed and running towards us, trying to get out of the city. Where is he? In this house right here? Yeah, right in front. This is third squad, we had two or three shooting around into a house where uh, we had two guys run into. It doesn't look like there were any Marines in there. The last couple lines was radio operator for our squad, so he was talking to Captain Brown, trying to get an idea of what was going on. Hey, don't fire two or three in there yet. Hey, Lions, you see him stick his head up before, right? Yeah, I saw him. Corporal Hunter, he was a third squad leader. He said they saw where the enemy went to. The building that we were talking about was a building that was partially under construction. I said, okay, then what we'll do is, in the after effects of the main gun round, 
you'll be able to go ahead and take your squad and secure that building. We fired five main gun rounds into that building. Hey, Doug, get your rifles up and watch. At this point, we thought everybody was dead. Uh, nobody could survive a tank shooting through this house that many times, like three or four times. There's nobody that could be alive. It's an impossibility. Look out, man. Look out. Climb into that window right in front of you there. And there was so much rubble from the tanks knocking the walls down, and the bodies were underneath the rubble. And that, that door up where we shot the guy's brain splattered on hadn't been cleared yet. We found a blood trail from where we had shot one of the guys and uh, the blood trail led out into the yard and we lost it there. You got a body? We were missing one guy, one body. We couldn't find one body. Myself and Lines went to the left. Someone from Jackson's team said, hey, you know, Payne, you know, he called it the, the crapper house, you know, watch the crapper house. Hey, watch that house in the back. Every other time except for then, I've always been the first man in the door anytime my team has to clear a room because I don't expect them to do anything I'm not willing to do. But for some reason, Lines was just one step ahead of me. I immediately knew that rounds were hitting the lines, and there was no way possible that I could have made entry to that room. Corporal Payne came running back around, uh, screaming that Lions was down, and uh, he was my prayer buddy. Uh, me and him were really close, and uh, he just had a uh, a baby daughter, Ella. And uh, we really wanted him to get home to see his daughter. I told the, uh, the tank platoon commander to run over the wall and knock it over on the enemy that was still inside. When the tank backed up, he was trying to crawl his way out of the debris to get to a weapon, and when he was crawling towards that weapon, he was shot again by at least three different people. You just hear a magazine getting emptied into him, another magazine getting emptied into him, and the guy's still kicking and screaming underneath the rubble, his hand's still moving, trying to reach for a weapon. Later, I found out that in the initial house, they had found vials of uh, adrenaline and some type of a drug that it, it could have been a crystal meth, a PCP, a cocaine, something, something that seriously gave these guys a heck of a lot more than a normal human being would function at. His body wouldn't go into shock. The guy finally just bled out, stopped moving. Those guys don't play around. Uh, it's hard to take them down when they don't feel pain. Hey, baby girl, how you doing? It's Daddy. Um, I'm making this recording here for you because I know your birthday's coming up here. You got about 15, 16 days or so. Um, and I hope that you have fun and that you guys have a real big party and everything and that you get a whole bunch of cool presents. Daddy really couldn't send you too much from over here because there ain't really much I can buy around this place. So I thought I'd draw you up a little picture of you and. Uh, Take a few pictures and make a little recording for you just to say happy birthday and let you know that daddy loves you very, very much and that he'll be home very soon. You've got about, I don't know, two and a half, three months. So you just keep being a good girl and help mommy out. Daddy will be home before you know it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop recording this because I don't really know too much more to say. Uh, it's probably a lot of stuff that you don't want to hear nothing about, but you keep being a good girl and daddy loves you very, very much. And happy birthday, okay? you enjoy this along with everything else that I'm sending. All right? Bye-bye. That squad was tight. Dyer was just silly. That kid, you know, well, I called him Pigpen because he always looked like, you know, he just rolled out of the mud. With Cifuentes, I was always getting people coming up to me and saying, man, is that guy yours? 
What a sharp kid. What a, what a smart guy. And he was, though. I mean, he just kind of exuded it. He was the one in grad school, just smart as a whip, so composed, and he was not foul-mouthed like the rest of us. He was a classy, classy individual. Can I get a comment? Well, I reckon we knocked off a few doors. How many? I'd say probably more than I can count, maybe 10, 12. Reed, with his goofy Harry Potter looks, throughout the whole deployment, you know, he was my best friend, and and Bernholtz was sleeping above me every night. <laughs> From the beginning, he didn't swear, he didn't, uh, he didn't drink, he didn't chew, he didn't smoke, he read his Bible, and we uh, changed him quite a bit, you know? Hey, what's up, Bernholtz? What's up, Bernie Mac? I'm impressed, dude. You all right? Hey, we're getting ready to go home in like two months. Two months? Yeah, it's only two months. We've been here like five. Forever. No, dude, it's oh, not it's that not. long. It's only two months. I hate you. It's not that bad. It's not that bad. Come on, guys, Please. I'm out. Whoa. What the hell are you doing, dude? Bertle. Oh, what the? <laughs> Bertie. I just <laughs> <laughs> On the first, we had a group of six snipers that um, were attached to 325. They were inserted approximately 2 o'clock in the morning. They made their way to their position. We can only assume that they were observed because uh, insurgents ambushed them as they were setting in. Already planned at that time, though, was, op was the operation itself, Operation Quick Strike. The regiment had moved a lot of assets from all around the country into position to conduct Operation Quick Strike, unbeknownst to a lot of the Marines. On the second, we found out that they had found Bosco's body on the other side of the river. And now everybody is just out for blood, you know? But we weren't really happy about the way that we were approaching that mission. Basically, we sat there for a day and waited. We weren't sneaky. They knew we were coming, and we knew they were waiting. Got up at, I think it was 4 o'clock. Aaron Reed woke me up, popped in a chew together, and went down the tracks. Everybody was sleepy. A little bit before we were about to take off, Major Tolan called down to me and told me we were switching the tracks. And I just looked at the guys, I was like, you know, catch you on the flip side. <laughs> and that was the last thing I said to him. We got everybody loaded into the different amp tracks. I was in the first one, and I had Sergeant Hicks and my radio man, Lance Corporal Williams. And we were off the road, but parallel to it, and we're driving south. We were going cross country in the desert. The problem was, now we have Iraqis with us. And I don't have the lift in my tracks to put their soldiers on board with us, so we have to take their vehicles with us. Well, their vehicles can't go cross country. We tried it, and after about 15 minutes, their, their trucks got stuck pretty bad. So we're sitting out there in the desert. I got battalions screaming at me, regiment screaming at them to get inside that town. So my XO calls me up and he said, hey, tanks cleared that road earlier this morning. So I said, okay. I called the tank company commander up, good guy. You know, trust his opinion. You know, he said, sir, we proofed that road. It's clear for you. I said, roger that. Got an LAR unit sitting right at the intersection. Uh, they see no movement, no activity. So I make the decision, all right, you know, with the information I got, let's go down the road. We got on the road, and uh, we take a right into the city of Barwana, where we were going to get out and start clearing the town. And um, right after I took that right, 
probably about, I don't know, 50, 75 meters, maybe 100 meters, there's a massive explosion. It was so big that I thought for sure it had hit my Amtrak, and I called it in immediately. I've hit an IED, I've hit an IED. And I looked back, and I couldn't tell what the hell had happened. I mean, it was just the most unbelievable sight. I was just like, there ain't nobody alive. And then the first thing that went to my mind was, what squad's that? We ran over there as soon as we could, and that's, you know, things start to get blurry at that point. The vehicle had been blown up and flipped, and this is a huge, like, 30-ton vehicle. It had been flipped onto its back, and everybody had been blown out in every direction. Um, the carnage of the scene was, was was bad. It's something I'll never forget. And uh, the odd things, it was just, you know, it was it was really bad. On the way there, that's when I realized what squad it was because I, I found a pack that had a name name tape on it, and it was it was Sefuentes. I got up on the roof. And I was looking back at the accident site, and uh, and I saw the guys go out there with blankets to cover up cover up the body parts, and uh, you know that's I went into a room and just started throwing everything around, um, and then I got up on the roof, and all I wanted to do was shoot anything that was moving, if it wasn't in desert camis, you know, it was going down. And uh, I got up there, I stayed up there, you know, just <laughs> crying. The closest guys that I've ever had as friends are all dead. When we came back from that mission, everybody uh, still had all their things laying out. My rack mate, Eric Bernholtz, you know, he even had a letter that he forgot to mail before he left. And, uh, you know, I saw that stuff and I saw, <laughs> I saw people's dirty laundry laying out and, um, you know, I, I just lost it again. It was, it was pretty much, you know, getting kicked over and over and over. And uh, for a while there, everywhere we'd go, I would think that I was seeing these guys. You know, I'd, I'd catch a glimpse of someone and say, hey, that's, you know, that's Reed. When I first got back, I was drinking, you know, heavily just to go to sleep. Everything after August 3rd happened so quick, and the next thing I knew it, I'm back home, you know. I'm signing back up for school, and I'm just a regular college kid now. <laughs> and uh, it's weird, you know, it's weird hopping, hopping from getting shot at in the desert to just walk into school. I guess I just feel like I'm not really ready to fit back in to society yet. Do you want some uh, three extra? Yeah. Right now, I need to be with people who have the experience. You know, all three of us that live in our house are combat vets. And, uh, you know, right now, that's what's helping me is, is having them around, having them close. Actually, I'm going to do San Juan. Yes. I 
that one. He had a bite. I guess right now, I can't settle with just saying, hey, it's over, you know, one time. I want revenge and I want to be there, you know, for my friends when they go back. Jason, he asks me all the time, hey, are you sure you want to go back? Are you ready? And, uh, you know, I don't, for sure, I don't know if I'm, if I'm ready to go back, but once you're in, you know, it's a family and, and especially with us, we're, I mean, we're exactly like a family. And uh, I know for a fact, if something happens to my friends over there and I'm sitting back here, I just don't think I could live with that. a lot of great guys, but it really would have disrespected their sacrifice if we didn't go forward. Where I think that, you know, in the reserves you're not prepared, you're not prepared mentally a lot of times for combat, to see death. And then even us as a nation, as Americans, you know, we forget that when you go to war, the end result will be somebody or several people dying. And, you know, it's, y y the only thing we could do was kick him in the ass and keep pushing him. As the missions keep coming, you start wondering, when is your ticket gonna be up? You know, we've fought our way through some of the most hellacious places in Iraq at the moment. And it was as if you just wanted to go find whatever HQ is making these decisions and just start smacking people. What more do they want? He's behind me, we pull him out, and I'm so close, I'm so close to shooting him, but I don't. It's not right, it's not. I, it make me no better than the people we're trying to fight over there. Up to that point, I wanted to stay in Iraq, and I realized that I needed to, I needed to leave. I needed to get back home and unwind. Just immense. 
there's so many people out there on the road. It took us maybe an hour and a half to get from the airport to our drill center, which isn't very far. And because there's so many people wanting to say, you know, welcome home. You should have seen the tears of the Marines' eyes when they saw all the people with banners and flags. And there were people out there that didn't agree with the war. There were people out there that, that had lost family members that didn't appreciate what their Marine was lost for. But they appreciated the sacrifices of the Marine unit from Columbus, Ohio. And that said everything to me. I feel like the only reason we got all this attention was because a lot of us were killed. And that's how I feel about it. I mean, if, if we all came back safe, nothing happened, there wouldn't have been anything for us. You know, I'm sure, you know, they would have been proud of us, but we wouldn't have had a parade. We wouldn't have had this. You know, we wouldn't have been interviewed. So, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't appreciate this stuff. I mean, I just want people to know about my friends. That's the only way I can do it, so. They're great people. And uh, they died in the most horrifying way. I mean, I know, I know people don't disrespect us. Not at all. But, uh, you know, I just want them to be remembered for what they did. Not just because they died. Sergeant Anthony L. Goodwin, 1st Platoon, Lima Company, 3rd Battalion, 25th Marines, killed in action, 8th May 2005, in New Ubaidi, Iraq. Corporal Dustin A. Durga, 1st Platoon, Lima Company, 3rd Battalion, 25th Marines, killed in action. 8th May 2005, the new Ubaidi, Iraq. Lance Corporal. First, I think that I really understood is that we ain't here forever. Um, you know, I, you know, at 18, I thought that same way too, that I'm invincible, and that uh, I'm gonna live forever. Uh, 10 feet tall and bulletproof. Christopher P. Lyons. And I walked away seeing men who had only lived for 24 years, 25 years, 26 years, and had already changed the world through the people they had touched and the lives they had touched. PFC Christopher R. Dixon, 1st Platoon, Lima Company, 3rd Battalion, 25th Marines, held in action 11 May 2005 in Ramana, Iraq. Lance Corporal Michael J. Sefuentes, 3rd Platoon, Lima Company, 3rd Battalion, 25th Marines, killed in action, 3 August 2005, in Bawana, Iraq. Lance Corporal Christopher... I don't want to be mad about anything. I don't have time to be mad about anything. I enjoy waking up every morning, and I, I just, you know, I feel lucky to be alive. And I guess is how I put it. Everything I do now, 
I'm doing for the guys who didn't come back. Through a lot. It, it's over. It, it's the past. Push it, push it. We want to remember what we did for the new guys to teach them. Um, we want to remember our fallen brothers. But there comes a time when we need to just put that aside. We've got to start training now for the next deployment. And I think a lot of the, a lot of the guys are like, you know, still feeling the, you know, <clears throat> they get over it, they get over it, they go over it, and then someone someone brings it back up. You know, and then they don't want to do that. They want to. They want to push forward. I think that's the, the that that right there would be would be great if everybody could understand that. You know. So. Come on, a little more, a little more. Ten, right there, fourteen. No doubt in my mind, I would go back to combat with this unit. These guys are Marines, and it doesn't matter if it's a reserve unit or active duty. All the things that we did, uh, no active duty unit could say they accomplished as much as we did.